world, wonderful thing. And hopefully there'll be enough light coming in that door over there that you'll all be able to see and navigate safely to the rest of here, especially once your eyes adjust to the dark. Um, my name is Bill Wren, and uh, I'm, I think my official title with the University of Texas is Public Affairs Specialist. Uh, but when they started uh, asking me to do um, night sky preservation and, and outdoor lighting control and stuff like that, they gave me a, a fancy title of special assistant to the superintendent. Uh, I think I'm now called dark skies coordinator. I'm not really sure. You can just call me Bill, okay? Uh, but um, I'm very happy to be here. It took some, uh, some playing around to figure out how to do this. Um, it, face to face instead of virtually and still be able to demonstrate a lot of what I want to show you. Um, in fact, um, if this were a regular time and we were meeting face to face, I'd be passing out some interactive stuff for people to do, but we, uh, I had to figure out another way to do it in the, the era of COVID, uh, for the time being at least. And um, hopefully um, we'll get it on down the road. Um, I should say, um, well, that uh, we'll take a break and when I get through this first set of slides and I've got some demos um, that I want to show you and um, uh, hopefully it'll make sense. If, if any time you have any questions along the way, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, as I understand it, this is the first in a series of three workshops that the city is hosting. Um, the second one will have to do uh, with uh, the lighting ordinance language, uh, the existing ordinance and proposed revisions to that ordinance. And then the third workshop will have to do with uh, drafting a formal or a final draft to go into the, to the whole city council. That, that's my understanding. That sounds about right, Eric? Yes. Close enough, okay. Yes. Um, so, let, let's just get on the road here. What I'm here to talk about, primarily, uh, is the sudden end of night. And I'll explain why I call it sudden um, here in just a second. But um, the other thing, this is about dark sky, not dark ground. Okay, you know, a lot of people will hear me coming. In fact, I've got this newspaper headline from the Odessa American that I just love from 1996 when I started doing this seriously. This is what a lot of people think when they hear me coming. I'm an astronomer from McDonald Observatory. I want to talk about preserving the night skies um, and uh, outdoor lighting control. And often the first thing that comes to mind is this guy wants us to turn our lights out. He wants to leave us in the dark, no safety, no security. Uh, it's simply not true. This is about dark skies, not dark ground. We, we are not against uh, outdoor lighting. Um, I want to talk about the re very recent, uh, at least in the course of civilizations, very recent introduction of white light at night. Okay, uh, white means blue rich, and I'm going to demonstrate that for you here in a second. And then light that's simply out of place. It's, it's light that's essentially wasted because you're spilling it on the neighboring properties where it's not wanted, or into the sky where it's not needed or wanted. Um, so um, those are kind of the themes that will run through this. But um, here's a really good example of what it is that we're in favor of. Now let's see here, I know I had a, a laser pointer once. There we go. Um, this is a city, a, a picture of the city of Tucson, Arizona. Um, and it's very, it's dated actually, it's taken back in the 1980s, but it it's illustrates the purpose quite well of their, Tucson, because of its proximity to our national observatory at Big Peak, uh, about 35 miles to the southwest of Tucson, has had a lighting ordinance in place since 1973. Um, actually, the first city in the country, in the world, to have an outdoor lighting ordinance was Flagstaff, Arizona, because of its proximity to Bowl Observatory. But most of the lighting, when this picture was taken, now, Mind you, this is on top of a five-story building looking down. This is basically the University of Arizona campus that we're looking at here. Most of the lighting in Tucson was good when this picture was taken. Those facilities that 
were not in compliance really kind of stand out, like sore thumbs, these bright blurry spots you see. Um, this is actually a swimming pool facility on campus at U of A, and this is a tennis court facility. Um, and notice the difference in lighting. Remember, this is taken from above. Here you see the bare light bulbs, which tells you that there's light shining above the horizon and into the sky. It's pure waste. Notice, however, the playing fields for the tennis courts. You do not see the light sources from above. There's no light shining directly into the sky. Well lit playing surface, but you don't see the light bulbs. You can see the tops of the poles where the light fixtures are situated, but all the light is going down on the playing field and not being wasted up. Same thing with the street lighting in Tucson, um, well lit sidewalks, highways, intersections, but you don't see the light bulbs from above. Here is a silhouette of a lamp post, a street light, and then you can see the tops of the lamp posts uh, going all the way down through town. That's good lighting. This is the kind of lighting we are in favor of. This is the kind of lighting we are trying to promote. The, the first order problem is to keep the light out of the sky, not shining directly up into the sky. You know, when I started this about 30 years ago, working with outdoor lighting, people were talking about low pressure sodium and high pressure sodium and mercury vapor. Uh, and then the LED came up. Back then, I, I used to think, you know, I don't care what color it is as long as it's not shining into the sky. But then the LED came along and it really got my attention. And, uh, but let, let me just give you a little bit of background about the, the region here. Um, as most of you may know, the seven counties surrounding the Dahl Observatory have outdoor lighting ordinances designed to protect the night skies for ongoing astronomical research uh, at McDonald Observatory, uh, as do all of the cities, the dozen or so cities within these seven counties. Now, county ordinances in Texas are kind of like unicorns. They're, they're really not supposed to exist. Um, counties can collect taxes and they can maintain the roads and that kind of thing, but they, they're really not supposed to legislate. But in 1978, the state legislature gave these seven counties explicit permission to adopt outdoor lighting ordinances for McDonald Observatory by name in the statute. Um, over the decades, when I came to work out here, Jeff Davis County was the only county that had, in 1990, uh, the only county that had an ordinance. Over the decades, uh, six out of the seven counties adopted ordinances voluntarily. Uh, Reeves County was the lone holdout, uh, and you'll see why. They, they may, well, they told me why. They were very upfront, very clear. They did not want any regulations that might scare away the oil and gas industry, okay? But now, in 2011, former Governor Perry signed a bill that changed the language from these seven counties may adopt lighting ordinances to these seven counties shall adopt lighting ordinances and threw the municipalities in for good measure. Uh, and now we have a huge plot of land here. Those seven acres represent 28,000 square miles, right at 28,000 square miles, 18 million acres. Uh, it's the, the largest piece of ground I'm aware of whose skies overhead are protected by law. Um, then enter the oil and gas industry, the boom in uh, directional drilling that came along about 2008. I'll introduce 5,000 blue dots uh, that represent drilling permits left by the Railroad Commission to explore for oil and gas, um, primarily in Reeves County, but also in Culberson and Pecos counties as well. The yellow dots actually are lease holdings from Apache Corporation. That's what they called the Alpine High play. Um, and I'll refer back to Apache in just a little bit because we, we really had great success working with them uh, on their outdoor lighting practices. Um, but um, it, th this isn't really about fracking, okay? I mean, fracking's been around since a long time. George Mitchell invented, invented fracking decades ago. It was the advent of directional drilling, being able to not just do a vertical well, but do a directional well into a formation instead of just through it, and that made fracking very profitable. 
Um, and so with that said, here's a, a few examples. This is a satellite image that was taken on. I've got some overlap there, sorry about that. Anyway, this is just uh, January of this year before the bottom fell out of the price of oil. Um, and you can see th this is taken from a satellite with an infrared sweep of, um, of uh, detectors. It's called the day-night band on the Veers, uh, the Veers sweep. Um, the thing to remember about Veers imagery, because you can go online and find this stuff, that's V-I-I-R-S. Veers satellite imagery is available online. You can look up, you can see the Border Patrol checkpoints south of, south of Marathon there, or south of Marfa, south of Alpine, south of Marathon. Um, just little installations will show up here. But the spectral sensitivity, the colors of light that this satellite sees are blind to blue light, okay? It's basically infrared. So anything that is pure blue would not show up in this. Now, mind you, it, it's rare to find a purely blue light source, as you'll see. Um, e even a blue LED is gonna emit some light uh, over into the yellow-red part of the spectrum. So this is a pretty good representation of what uh, things look like. Now, there have been two atlases published over the decades um, that take this satellite data and crunch it through some software that draws in some sky glow contours. It shows you how dark the sky is in a particular region with black being the darkest and pushing towards white is the brightest. So, you know, downtown El Paso, Juarez, um, you're lucky to see a dozen stars on a good night. By the time you get out into the dark green, you just begin to see the Milky Way again. I uh, notice McDonald Observatory is in a very dark spot. Um, Alpine it stands out. Now that was 1997. That's pre-oil and gas boom. Okay, they republished the uh, the atlas using 19 uh, 2014 data after the oil and gas boom. So I'll call your attention to the city of Pecos right here. Watch what happens over 17 years. And that's all oil and gas related spreading out there, that's not population growth, okay? But notice McDonald Observatory remains in a very dark spot. And we have been working uh, with the town of Fort Davis especially. Uh, there was another fellow, Danny Self, owns the Marathon Motel. We did work out in Marathon. Notice that the signatures of both Fort Davis and Marathon actually decrease, which is kind of interesting. At least it's, uh, it, it, you know, I wouldn't, want to try and quantify that, but at least it shows you that you can make a difference uh, down the road. Uh, I, I just want to get McDonald Observatory out of the way because there have been people have asked a lot of questions about what the oil and gas industry might be doing to science, whether Alpine's interfering with our science. So, so uh, I'll get that out of the way and we'll go on and talk about lighting in general for the community. But we've been measuring now uh, since 2015 uh, the sky glow over McDonald Observatory um, with this uh, apparatus is just a science grade camera on the telescope mount and it automatically takes 45 images of the night sky, very high resolution, and stitches them together into a beautiful false color all sky panorama. It's 360 degrees around the horizon and straight up to overhead, zenith. You can see the Milky Way arching through here. Um, and the zodiacal light is this glow, that sunlight scattering off of dust particles in the atmosphere, uh, in the solar system, orbiting around the, the flame in the solar system with the planets. You need a really dark sky to be able to see that kind of stuff. Um, and given the exact time and place when these images were taken, the natural light sources, the, the stars, the Milky Way, and so on, can be modeled and subtracted from this, leaving only the unnatural sources of light. So this is, uh, well, this is El Paso Juarez, and uh, that would be the Aristat balloon, actually. Um, Marfa, I believe, and then Alpine is here, and then this is the glow from the Permian Basin. Now this number, 26%, 
tells us that there's 26% more light. Let me back up to this image. There is 26% more light in this image than would be if it were all just natural light. So there's 26% of that light is artificial. And almost all of it is coming from the Permian Basin. Um, notice that it's the brightening that we're seeing, it's concentrated down low to the horizon. It's not all over the sky. This is an all sky average, that 26% is, is averaged out over the entire sky, but almost all of the brightening we see is occurring in the direction of the Permian Basin down well below 30 degrees above the horizon. Um, for most of the history of the observatory, El Paso Juarez was the brightest source of light pollution in our sky. So this definitely has got our attention and uh, every time the moon and the weather uh, permitted, we're out gathering data. And here's a plot of, I'm sorry? Oh, I thought I heard a question. Um, this is the plot of the data that we've gathered starting in August of uh, 2015. We were actually using a borrowed a unit from the National Park Service. I should have plugged National Park Service, sorry Raymond. Uh, it was the Night Skies Division, so Natural Sounds and Night Skies Division of the National Park Service that devised this apparatus that we replicated and are using to uh, measure um, how much artificial light there is in the sky. And you can see it trended upward for quite a while, and then we reached a high of 49%. Above natural background, but now we're back down. That last reading is the 26% that I showed you. So we're we're back down to a level that we haven't seen in a, in a you know couple of years since back in the 2018. So this probably is a good indication of the, the drop in uh, activity in the Permian. Um, good news is, um, real quick, I, I I I had some slides I was going to show you, but they're not really that important. Be aware that um, a group of uh, legislators um, have written a letter to the Railroad Commission asking them to please stop flaring natural gas, which is, uh, it contributes to the sky glow that we're seeing from the Permian. By 2025, uh, BP and Shell have asked the same thing. There's a, it's just wasted resource. It's just like burning money. Um, there's also some, you know, on the level of trillion dollar investors that are asking the Railroad Commission, again, to outlaw unnecessary uh, flaring in the atmosphere by 2025. So hopefully that will have an impact on what we see here. Um, lastly, if I can get this to work, I just want to point out that we uh, are embarking on an application to the International Dark Sky Association uh, to form the Greater Big Bend International Dark Sky Reserve with Big Bend State uh, Ranch State Park, Big Bend National Park, Black Gap uh, as cores in the south. This is a Chinati Mountains natural, state natural area that's actually a part of the Big Bend Ranch State Park. And then the uh, Nature Conservancy and all their easements up here along with the McDonald Observatory would form another core to the north. But this is on the order of uh, 12,000 12, square miles, if I'm not mistaken. And it includes these three protected areas south of the river uh, in Old Mexico. This is uh, Santa Elena, um, Ocampo, and um, help me. Um, Sierra del Carmen. Yeah, the Sierra del Carmen. Um, I've been in touch with representatives of Cenex Corporation. See, it's a, it's a different story here. These are public lands here. Uh, but this is all private land. But Cenex Corporation is the biggest landowner uh, in these areas, and I've been in touch with representatives of Cenex, and they're they're on board 100%. So this is down the road. It's going to be some time to get all the readings we need and all the, the moving parts in place and all the people on board. Uh, but we are looking at uh, an international dark sky reserve. There are 16 of them in the world today, all around the globe. This will be larger than all the other 16 combined. So, hey, Texas. So, light. Um, how did we get to this place? For the longest time, um, this was it. Starlight and moonlight 
I love this picture. This was uh, taken uh, over on the Big Island of Hawaii. This is a, a shrine a, 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 that's actually a piece of coral that iridescence uh, from the light from the stars. Um, anyway, that was pretty much it until fire came along. And that's the way it was for, what, 100,000 years or so? Um, firelight was the only other source of light we had at night besides natural sources, starlight, moonlight. Um, we harnessed fire, we were able to carry it around with us, torchlight. Notice the color of this stuff, though. Gaslight, and then incandescent light bulb came along. This is the guy to blame, Thomas Edison, 1878, invented this thing. But notice again the color. Even up until recent times, the incandescent bulb has been this warm, what, what the industry would call a warm white color, okay? Then, well, here, let me show you this bit. This gives you a, an idea of what's happened. Just, like I said, the recent loss of night, okay? Um, this is a picture of Los Angeles, California, taken uh, from Mount Wilson, where the 100-inch telescope is located. It was the largest telescope in the world for, for many decades. Um, it was actually built 10 years after this photo was taken, but this is uh, 30 years after the light bulb was invented in Los Angeles. Uh, this LA basin is, uh, is being electrified. Now I'm gonna jump forward 100 years to 2008 and show you the comparison. Now, in order to get it all in here, I'll have to zoom out. So there's LA in 1908, and then 2008. I'll blink those just for fun. If you notice, it, it, this dog leg right here, that little thoroughfare, whatever it is, um, for scale, you can compare it in the two images. And notice the color here too. This is almost all high pressure sodium lighting, okay, which is about 2200 degrees Kelvin. We'll talk a little more about the Kelvin scale in a minute. Um, but of late, well, around World War II, mercury vapor came along. And for the first time in our history, blue white light was introduced into our nighttime environment. And nobody really stopped to think about any consequences that might have, but it turns out it has some major consequences, especially for the environment, uh, wildlife, human health, and so on. Um, oh, thank you, very kind. Then the LED, the light emitting diode, really good technology. Um, don't know what, I mean, what, what to say about it. It's great stuff if it is used properly. Um, here are some selling points for the LED. It is very cost efficient. Um, consumes only about maybe 20, 15 to 20 percent of the light from uh, compared to an incandescent bulb. It has on the order of 20 year lifespan, so you're not constantly changing bulbs. It's solid state lighting, which is one reason why it lasts so long. But it, it's, it's digital, it can be controlled in software. So a, a city can, can have LED lights that are radio controlled and it, at 11 p.m. they turn off half of them. And, and at 3 a.m. they turn off the other half of them. They're actually doing that in Ciudad Juarez, uh, south of uh, El Paso, and their customers are getting rebates, or at least they were, this is back Went back, way back when El Paso was adopting its lighting ordinance. Um, and they're very blue rich, at least the early generations of LEDs were very bluish. They were the easiest to fabricate, they were the most cost efficient, and everybody saw, wow, we can save 80% on our electric bill. Cities all around the world jumped on the LED bandwagon with the blue rich form of LEDs. The warm, you can manufacture a warm light LED, but it used to be less cost efficient. It was more expensive to produce, but that was 10, 15 years ago. Today, a warm white LED should be no more expensive and just within two to 4% efficient, cost efficient 
um, as a blue light, a warm light and a cool light. Um, so here's a comparison chart for different light sources and their cost efficiency. Incandescent is the least efficient, um, you know, 95 plus percent of the energy that goes into an incandescent light bulb comes out as heat, not light. Um, in uh, metal halide, well, mercury vapor, right, or high pressure mercury, um, high pressure sodium, metal halide, high pressure mercury, uh, and, met, yeah, and then the LED just kind of goes through the roof as far as cost efficiency goes. So a lot of cities jumped on the bandwagon early uh, and adopted the early generations of LEDs that were very blue rich. They were the most cost efficient and the least expensive, but that's changed. Here, for example, is LA, um, seen from above, again, mostly high pressure sodium you're seeing there, uh, seeing there, but two years later, after they retrofitted a couple of hundred thousand street lights to LEDs, very bluish, a lot of blue light. Now, why should you mind? Well, I'm gonna get to that. Uh, Phoenix also, all the white light. Um, when you think white, you gotta think blue rich because that's how you get it to white. Now, a lot of cities have done this and regretted it, um, especially in residential neighborhoods uh, when, when blue light, uh, blue white LEDs have been installed. I'm just gonna put up an article here um, that um, talks about the city of Davis, California. They installed uh, 5,000 degree Kelvin LEDs, that's about daylight in color, okay? Um, and in residential neighborhoods, people were complaining. They were balking. The light was too harsh at night. It cast dark shadows. Um, it, uh, you know, disrupting people's sleep and what have you. So the city of Davis, California actually went back and changed the lights out again. They had been high pressure sodium. They went to the white LEDs. Then they went to the, the cool white LEDs. Then they went to the warm white LEDs. And in that conversion, they lowered the lumen output just enough to reduce the power consumption just enough to pay for cleaning up the mess that they had made by installing the blue white LEDs. So blue light is not bad, okay, in the daytime. That's why the sky is blue. I mean, you know, blue light in the daytime keeps you alert and awake. Um, it's good in the daytime, but it, it's completely out of place at night. It only came along with the advent of mercury vapor, and we're only just now starting to recognize the consequences of introducing bluish, blue-white light into our nighttime environment. Now, here's that Kelvin scale I was talking about before. 1,000 degree Kelvin, very warm. Um, 2,200 is about high pressure sodium. Uh, what we're recommending in the, the uh, Alpine Lighting Ordinance is 2,700 K. I'll show you many examples of that. Um, this is daylight, about 5,500. And then the cool white. But now notice to go from warm to cool, of course they've got it backwards here because this is hotter on the temperature scale. But in appearance, it's you know icy blue, I guess, right? But in order to go from a warm white light to a cool white light, you add blue. The more blue you put in, the closer to white it gets, and then you get past white, and it just it's a, it's a bluish light. And I've got a little setup here to demonstrate this for you. So the slide's going to go dark for a second. If I can make this happen, no one will be more impressed than I. I can tell you that. Don't, don't go away here. I've got to bring up my webcam that I have fitted with a diffraction grating. Okay, let me make this full screen. And I've got a light bulb over here on a dimmer. You'll be able to see it. It's a spectrum. It's just a just an incandescent light bulb. It maxes out about 2,700 degrees Kelvin. By the way. But notice the spectrum, the, the webcam is right here, by the way, and it's got a little diffraction grating on it. So I can, there's the light bulb. So you've got a first order uh, spectrum there, 
of uh, this incandescent light bulb. Now this light bulb is on a dimmer, so I can turn down the temperature of the filament, all right? Uh, and as I do so, watch what happens to the colors in the spectrum, okay? So I'm gonna cool it down now. The whole thing is gonna fade. See about the colors. Which end of it is disappearing fastest? There's no blue left. Some green, orange, and red. The yellow maybe, but watch as I heat the filament of the bulb back up. Watch how the spectrum pushes from the red end back over into the blue as it gets hotter. See? So you get to from a warm white to a less warm white um, by adding blue light, basically. Okay, now I've got one other example I can show you. This is a really cool little dust lamp that uh, you can adjust the brightness and the color temperature. Let me show you this spectrum. Now this is an LED, okay? So this is very much what you would expect to see. On, 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 there in an LED, there is a blue spike. It's kind of burned in here, but there's a real bright patch in the blue. And then this continuum over here in the yellow and red part of the spectrum um, is phosphor that is basically incandescent um, and gives you that feeling of white light. Now, let me change the color temperatures on these. I'm going to cool it down again. Watch, watch what happens to the spectrum. It's okay. We're good. And if I can find the right button, here we go. Point. See that? The, the blue peak, that bright blue line is going down and the red is shifting over to the red part. As we go from a cool white to a warm white, the blue in the spectrum lessens. Now that's warm white, and there's still a lot of blue in the spectrum. Uh, it's probably easier to illustrate graphically in these slides, so get back to that uh, one more time just for fun. Very bright in the blue. Shifts over towards the red. What that looks like graphically. I think I'm in the right place to do this. It doesn't recognize me. There we go. Okay, so here's our spectrum. All the colors in the rainbow extends out ultraviolet to the left and out to infrared and right. Circadian input <clears throat> talked about the consequences of blue light at night. Basically, it disrupts your circadian rhythm. Um, in, in particular, blue exposure to too much blue light at night suppresses the production of melatonin. Melatonin, I've heard it called a hormone, but I, I don't believe it is. It's actually a molecule. It likes to eat tumors, for one thing. It facilitates restorative sleep. If you're not getting good sleep, uh, it may well be, uh, you know, melatonin uh, is, is suppressed in your bloodstream. You're not getting good sleep. It's going to suppress your immune system, just everything. Everything from cancer to depression, uh, they have linked to exposure to too much blue-rich artificial light at night. Our visual system simply did not evolve with blue light in the environment. It's very, very new in the history of civilization. So I put in the little bracket line there to show you where about 80% of the, the circadian sensitivity is. And then here's the results from a study that show Blue depleted light 
very little blue light, the melatonin production, this is between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. Shows melatonin production at night, and then blue, exposure to blue-rich light at night um, is the yellow bar at the bottom. Melatonin production is dramatically suppressed. This has been replicated over and over again from mice to humans. Um, and it is the AMA, the American Medical Association, has written paper after paper warning against the adoption of blue LEDs for street lighting and so on. So um, that is to be noted. I mean, nobody really ever stopped to think about the consequences of blue light at night, but now we're starting to learn. So here are some spectra of some other sources. This one you've seen, this is just the daytime solar spectrum. Um, nice peak in the blue, then LEDs have that peak in the blue and then this continuum out into the green, yellow, and red. An incandescent bulb, very little in the blue. Fluorescent, it's basically mercury phase uh, rich in the blue. Now what they do to adjust the colors with the LEDs like I just did, it's called the blue pump. <clears throat> back to this. They take light energy from this blue peak and use it to excite the phosphors in this continuum over here and go from a hot light, they reduce the amount of blue light, they increase the amount of this continuum. As they lower the color temperature, the blue light is reduced, the blue peak goes down, the hump gets bigger, and so on, down to 2700 K there is still a substantial amount of blue light in the spectrum even at 2700K. Remember, uh, high pressure sodium is at 2200 uh, Kelvin. Now, you can manufacture a LED to give you any color you want. Uh, you can filter it. In fact, um, we uh, got some filtered LEDs donated to us they call them 500 nanometer cutoff because that, that's basically over here is where blue light is. And there's absolutely no blue in the spectrum. And we installed them at great expense um, for the money, by the way, that was donated by a guy named James Walker who lived in South, uh, lived in Double Diamond and passed away about 12 years ago and left $10,000 um, for dark sky preservation. And we were able to spend that $2,000 $10,000 in three different jobs, and this was one of them. This is Porter's up in Fort Davis. That is 500 nanometer cutoff LEDs. There is zero blue light in these LEDs. And that, granted, the color rendition may not be all that pleasing to the eye, but the reds are very apparent. If you had a, if there was an American flag displayed on the ground right there, you'd see the red, you'd see the white, the blue would appear black, okay? Um, so there's just no blue uh, in these LEDs. Now, the American Petroleum Institute, as a result of a, a refinery accident some years ago, linked it to fatigue, worker fatigue, shift worker fatigue, people working overnight, that they were exposed to too much blue light. So they have actually banned, they've said, well, it's a, it's a recommended practice. RP755, for those of you who want to look up uh, API, RP755, there is to be less than 2% blue light uh, for shift workers at night. It's an ANSI standard as well, uh, and it is certified by Underwriters Laboratory. 80% between 440 and 490 uh, nanometers in wavelength, that's the blue light sensitivity, that's your circadian uh, sensitivity right there, they want to do away with it. The lighting manufacturers, and this is just a caution, beware, you can do, you can manufacture an LED to give you any color of light, any spectral distribution you want. Here's what one group has come up with, a group called Circadian Lighting. Um, they want to remove the blue altogether, and in order to maintain the color rendition of white light, they're going to put in a purple not a blue pump, but a purple pump. So now we're introducing violet into the nighttime environment. So get your sunscreen out and your sunglasses, your blue blocker sunglasses. Uh, 
can't imagine what we do for the people with cataracts at night. But anyway, this is something that is actually going on the market to try and satisfy the oil and gas industry recommendation to get rid of blue light at night because it leads to worker fatigue. Okay, um, these are the basic arguments in favor of controlling outdoor lighting and not just making it as bright as you can. I mean, the, the first time I stepped foot on an oil rig back in 2013, I was told you can't have too much light on an oil rig. Light it up like daytime, the brighter the better. That is a very common assumption that people approach lighting their property at night. I just want to light it up as bright as I can. More light means more security. Um, well, I'm gonna try and illustrate to you that it's not the case. Um, but really, uh, five good arguments, preserving the night skies, the cost efficiency, because you're not wasting light off property and into the night sky, safety and security, and this is really about reducing flare, which we'll talk about in some detail, health and environment we touched on, and then just the appearance, the aesthetics of it. I didn't used to include this, but uh, Lisa Fielder, up in uh, Midland uh, told me, you know, you should include that as an argument because it really looks better. And I'll show you what they did with the, their front porch lights. It's actually pretty cool. But first, the dark skies argument. Uh, this is from that catalog or that atlas from 2014 um, that shows lights seen from space at night with the sky glow contours drawn in. Um, you may notice Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, this is the Eagle for Shale, oil and gas. Then here's Midland, Odessa right here. And then this is all Permian Basin activity. And uh, here we are down, down here in a really nice spot. This is what we're trying to preserve with that International Dark Sky Reserve. Uh, the trend is not all that great. Um, by 2025, well, basically everything east of Interstate 35 is toast as far as seeing a dark sky. So the places where you can go to see a naturally dark nighttime sky, see the Milky Way, uh, are shrinking. They're, be they're becoming fewer and farther between. Estimates are currently over 80% of the population of the United States live under conditions where they cannot see the Milky Way out their back door. Okay, so what are we losing? I'll, I don't have the answer to that. I'll pose that question to you. What are we losing by not being able to see the Milky Way? This is a beautiful uh, little time-lapse video that uh, Joe Hansen did for PBS. This is from McDonald Observatory. Here's Alpine, by the way. That's Mitre Peak sticking up. Um, that's the lights in Mountainside. That's Range Animal Science. Got Marfa, got Presidio over here. See if I can make it play. We still have very dark skies at McDonald Observatory, folks. Absolutely beautiful. So what's the value of that? Well, the best I can do is offer this up. If Van Gogh were alive today, would he be inspired to paint Starry Night from San Rome in France? I couldn't see the Milky Way from San Rome today. Okay, um, here's a quote. So, what value <laughs> is dreaming? What value are we losing uh, by losing sight of the night sky? Then there is. The draw, these dark regions that are left, like here in West Texas, are a major draw to people. Um, astrotourism is a term that's been coined in recent years to describe people traveling to dark locations in order to have this experience of, of seeing the larger context that we live in. Um, I know dozens and dozens of amateur astronomers who have retired to this region and built backyard observatories because of the dark skies. We've got the Texas Star Party that shows up every May or so at the Food Ranch, you know, four to 600 people put quite a pump into the, uh, the local economy. Um, so there's a lot to be said 
for making this region a dark sky destination for people, okay? It's relatively accessible, it's just half hour off I-10, right? Um, in fact, here you go, this brings it a little closer to home. I don't know if y'all remember a guy named Gil Barti, but back in 2009, he uh, was in charge of sales out of Sierra Leone, and he administered this interest inventory to anybody shopping for land at Sierra Lorana, whether it was over the phone, online, in person, he administered this interest inventory to see what it was that drew them to Sierra Lorana, Sierra Lorana to shop for land. And lo and behold, astronomy, dark sky related activity, uh, tops it out big time. Uh, I guess the next closest competitors, hiking, photography, are, are up there. And of course, you know, everybody knows the fishing is really good around here. <laughs> That's like a joke, it's just not very funny. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> and uh, Big Bend National Park said about relighting, um, well, Chisos Basin, Panther Junction, Rio Grande Village. It was uh, Musco Lighting that gave them, I think, about a third of a million dollar grant to, I mean, they trenched and relit everything 12 volt BC to put in LEDs. I can remember before this retrofit was done, this, this changeover to LEDs was done, I can remember coming out of the lodge in the Chisos Basin after having a meal and gotten dark, and I'm walking to my car and I'm looking up at Casa Grande, waving my arms and I could see my shadow up on the mountain, you know, the light was just spewing up into the sky, pure waste. And then this uh, contemporaneous quote from Don Vandenberg, Thief of Interpretation, most popular formal program, okay, or the nighttime uh, activities. In fact, the National Park Service say they see about 10 times the attendance at their nighttime programs as they do at their daytime programs. Now you probably have you know more daytime programs than all those attendees converge on one nighttime program. Who knows how to explain it? But the point is, it's very popular uh, in the National Park Service. They recognize that and are working really hard um, to keep the parks dark. So uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about lights. This is an old uh, Nema head or barnyard style mercury vapor light, and this is a flat lens cobra head. Um, good light. There's a lot of these around town if you look for them. Uh, not so good light. Uh, in fact, uh, we put up, when I came here, it was, it was probably 91, we put up, we, there was private money um, donated by donor. Donors um, gave us enough money to buy about 600 shields that attach these are clip-on. You just unclip this and you clip on that. We started in Balmeray. They, uh, West, back then, West Texas Utility put up about 86 or so along the streets in Balmeray. Um, 180 some odd went up in Martha. Over 300 went up here in the city of Alpine. You'll see them around here, right across the street here at the middle school. You can see a bunch of them up. Uh, that was kind of my first taste at uh, at the, the cost efficiency argument, really. In fact, I can illustrate that. Here's um, a photograph taken by a fellow named Dave Esper, who used to live uh, here. This was before he came down here, actually. This is a mercury vapor uh, uh, lamp, 175 watts out of his bedroom window. Notice the second story room up here. I mean, if that's some kid's bedroom or something, I would be unhappy. But we got some shield. They don't make these anymore. Uh, Hubble Lighting used to make these, um, sold them for first $17 a piece and then $37 a piece. Now you can't buy them, but these are high bait shields for warehouses and they can be adapted to fit on these things. But here's after the light was installed. Notice, well, I'll put up a comparison here so you can see. I, I, in particular, I just call your attention to the second story window here. Um, the, there's more light on the ground at the intersection. In fact, Dave took the light meter, went out to the base of that pole, and walked out 100 feet. And by the way, 
in terms of the amount of useful light you get from a light on a pole or mounted on the side of a wall or whatever, it's a one to four ratio. You get useful light four times the mounting height distance. So this is 25 foot high, then 100 feet out radius would be the amount of area that receives useful light. Dave measured the intensity of light in foot candles falling on the ground from zero out to 100 feet. Without the shield installed, this was how bright the light was on the ground. With the shield installed, this is how bright the light was on the ground. If you do the math, the area, the difference between these two curves comes out to 47%. So half again as much light on the ground from the same light fixture just by putting the shield on it. Okay, so more light on the ground. In fact, Hubble lighting for a time was selling, they called them sky caps, the Hubble sky cap. They were selling the sky cap as part of a kit. They would give you the shield and a 100 watt high pressure sodium replacement bulb designed to work in the same ballast as the 175 watt mercury vapor. So it was, you know, get better visibility and reduce your energy consumption by almost half at the same time. That was the way they were marketing it for a while. Some of y'all might remember when Stripes bought out Town and Country and relit the store. Um, one of the first times I can rem remember when gasoline was at $2.74 a gallon. Um, first people to complain lived across the street. Notice the trees, all right? If you got trees lit to the top like that from light coming out from under a gas can. It's just pure waste. I, I, this is the kind of stuff I always look for when I'm driving around. Are the trees lit to the top? Can you see the power lines, the, the tops of the power poles? Why do you need to light those things up? All it does is indicate that light's going into the sky. But to their credit, Stripes stepped up and they relit the store. We actually got a call from code enforcement here in Alpine and they put us in touch with Stripes. We had them up to the observatory, showed them around and talked about what might be done. And uh, they relit with recessed LED lighting. Mind you, it cost them an extra dollar a gallon of gasoline to do that. <clears throat> Somebody and after, okay? Um, so the light is staying on their property. What got their attention, however, was the reduction in power consumption going from metal halide to LED. Per gas pump canopy, they went from drawing 5,700 watts to 1,200 watts, times 480 stores chain wide. Okay, you can hear the bells ring off. Here's Marble Falls. Brand new facility incorporating night sky friendly LEDs, night sky friendly to the first order and that there's no light shining into the sky. The color temperature is still way high. We're, this is still you know, 10 years ago. Um, and it is way overly lit, much, much brighter than it needs to be. Um, in fact, the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America set standards for, for outdoor lighting, indoor lighting, any kind of lighting application you can imagine. For a gas pump island, they recommend 10 to 15 foot candles at, on the ground at the gas pump, depending upon how bright the surrounding environment is, okay? For an operating theater in a hospital, they recommend 100 foot candles, plenty bright be able to see what you're doing. At the gas pumps here in Marble Falls, we measured 140 foot candles. So enough light to top off your tank and do brain surgery at the same time. Um, it doesn't have to be this way though. I, you know, I, I, I should also add that, that they relit two stores in, in Marfa as well. And I went to one of the city council meetings there and there was a public comment section. People were lining up to the microphone to speak to the council, and they were complaining that the lights at the, at the, the stripes were so bright that they'd spend five minutes under those lights topping off their tank 
their eyes would get adjusted to that very bright light, they drive back out on the Highway 90 and they're blind as bats. Okay, so City Council of Marfa at the time considered it a public safety hazard and thought to strikes and uh, passed a lighting ordinance, I might add. But here's a shell station in Houston. Notice it's not overly lit. Notice the color temperature, that's 2,700 degrees Kelvin. Uh, and the lights are recessed into the canopy. It can be done well. It can be done well. And then, hey, don't forget my geese. Um, this is in Bastrop, actually. Uh, very nice, nicely done. And notice that the, the, the facade around the gas pump canopy is not lit, um, like so many uh, are, um, which shines light into the sky. Here's the elementary school gymnasium uh, in Marfa. They had two 150 watt metal halide wall packs. One of them burned out and they replaced it with an LED. And they went from 150 watts to 18 watts. Woohoo! Now I turned around, by the way, 180 degrees and looked at the property across the street and took this photo. I will guarantee you that most of that light lighting up those trees all the way to the top is coming from this fixture, not from this fixture, okay? So it can be done well. Here's the food bank here in Alpine. They had a 400 watt uh, high pressure sodium. We purchased them with, again, uh, donated money, private money. We purchased them a 30 watt LED full cutoff fixture that directs, you can see the, light, the footprint, the light, it's all going down to the sides. Then there's the issue of glare. Um, you know, that's why people dim their lights when they're driving down the highway toward you, at least you hope they do. This is a classic photo. You know, the, the eye and the camera don't work exactly the same, but yet this is still a pretty good illustration of what glare can do to your visibility. There's a guy standing there, and you don't see him until you block out that blurry light source. Right there. And, well, we uh, gave a talk to WPX Energy, uh, a contractor safety meeting a few years ago uh, up in Carlsbad. It's been a few years, maybe just a year ago. It's all a blur right now, but one of the things we suggested they do was just a demonstration. Just do a demo on one facility or even one corner of one facility. In particular, if you have adjustable floodlights, aim them straight down, which they did. And I got a piece of email and some photographs from Olivia McNamara, Manager of Health, Safety, Environment at WPX Energy. They were aimed up before, they aimed them straight down, the employees love it. One comment, you can actually see the equipment and where he is walking now. They implemented this across uh, their field. So that's very encouraging. That's something you can do without spending any money other than a bucket truck and a guy with a wrench to aim the light fixtures down, okay? Um, Apache, who I referred to earlier, uh, took this to heart and designed some facilities from scratch using 2,700 degree Kelvin light, LED lights, full cut off, all the lights going down. This is taken from a drone about 300 feet up. You don't see the bare light bulbs from above, so there's no light shining up into the sky, and you have a well-lit working environment. This, by the way, is the uh, cryo plant up just north of uh, Balmory on 2903. That's the same thing. They use the same light fixtures, and they love it. They're saying, you know, gosh, by directing the light, putting it where we want it to go, instead of just throwing it everywhere, we can use fewer lights. We're not buying as much lighting hardware. We're not, we're not consuming as much electricity. We can see better. It is safer, okay? So glare is a big deal. Um, this is from the Railroad Commission. When you hear increased worker safety from the Railroad Commission, it tends to get people's attention in the industry. Okay, so this was a real win. They, we had a number of demonstration projects in the oil field where people 
looked at it, they tried the suggestion, they looked at it, and they said, by golly, I can see that. And this is the result. They issued this originally in February of 16 and reissued it in February 2019. And then there's the question of health. I won't go into it in great detail. I already have talked about melatonin production and what have you, but if you go online and do a search for light pollution and health, you'll find yourself depressed in no time at all. Uh, you know, staring at a, a tablet screen or your phone screen or a TV screen right before you turn off the lights to go to sleep is probably not a very good idea. It's going to take your body hours to figure out it's really dark and start producing melatonin. And it's across the environment, okay? Uh, habitats of all kinds. The Audubon Society estimates one billion bird kills per year from birds colliding with buildings, overly lit buildings. They can't see the glass. It disorients them, okay? A billion bird kills a year. I don't like talking about bad lighting, so I'm including some good lighting here in town. I think some of you may have already seen this photo, but uh, this is a, an LED parking lot light. It's very hot. Um, there's another one over here just out of sight that's putting this light on the ground here. But all this light, this is 2700 Kelvin, and this, this is uh, recessed. You don't see the bare light bulbs. You just see a well-lit environment. That's the idea. And it wasn't dark when I took this photo, but the same thing here with the, the Transpecos Bank. Um, note the footprint of the light coming down, not going out the top, but coming down, and then the light on the sign here. Uh, there's, this one ha wasn't lit yet. It wasn't dark when I took the picture, but you get the idea. Good lighting. There's a lot of good lighting in town, and it can be done. Oh, here is uh, what I was talking about from uh, Guy and Lisa Fielder uh, up in uh, Midland. They had these two carriage lamps at their front door. Now again, the eye and the camera are a little different, and I think they took this with their phone, so it probably adjusted for this. But these are unshielded. You can clearly see the pattern of light going up out of the fixture. The light bulb is just right in the middle there. So they bought a couple of replacements, and they replaced them one at a time. Step one, notice the light footprint, the light cone coming down, not going up. Step two, both of them in place. By golly, there's a fly on the door there. So from that to that, by using a full cutoff fixture. Here the light sources are recessed up in the hoods of these carriage lamps. They're still attractive. I mean, they're, they're not ugly looking fixtures. It can be done. This is up at the Hotel Olympia. Uh, the orchard building is, is here. Um, this is the old bistro, Blue Mountain Bistro, and the uh, other hotel grounds. They put in some, some uh, notice though the color here stands out <laughs> starkly from the rest of the facilities. But they put in some dark sky fixtures, which is great, but they use these LEDs, which were too long for the fixtures, and they protruded out the bottom. So you got this bright, glary blue LED. And cross my heart and hope to die. I went to talk to the maintenance guy at the Hotel Olympia and he said, it's funny you should mention that. You know, almost every morning we go out and we find these light bulbs lying on the ground. People staying in the rooms didn't care for that bright, harsh, glary light, and would just go out and unscrew it and set them on the ground. Okay, so we, we bought them some replacement bulbs, 2,700 degrees Kelvin, and um, makes quite a difference. That's just aesthetically. I mean, forget all the rest of it. And I, I mentioned I mentioned this to to Eric earlier, but sports lighting. Here's an example. I mean. You cannot, you cannot mention uh, any form of outdoor lighting where the principles that I'm talking about here today are not applicable. I mean, any kind of lighting. In fact, um, we were talking with Rick Stevens uh, uh, earlier. He's a pilot, 
And, and I often tell people when I do presentations in the big city that if you want to see examples of good lighting, the kind of lighting we're trying to promote, visit your local major airport. Pilots were among the first people to say, boy, those bright, glary lights on the ground sure make it hard for me to land at night. They need to be shielded, so I don't see them. And that's really where a lot of full cutoff fixtures uh, started being introduced into the market. But notice, it's the playing field that's lit here, not the surrounding neighborhood, okay? This is really good lighting. Here's Alpine from uh, Hancock Hill. Stephen took a series of photos, thank you very much. Um, this is East 90 uh, out here. Um, and I'll, I'll add, and I'm, I'm happy to copy the link to you guys uh, at the city of Alpine if you like. He did uh, a series of images through a 150 millimeter lens of the main body of the city of Alpine. It's so high resolution, it's a 200 megabyte file. I'll have to send you a link to it so you can download it. But you can go in and all the way out to Border Patrol, west of town, you can identify individual light bulbs throughout the entire city from the, the pictures that he took just a few nights ago. Uh, from a different perspective, Sierra La Rana, I, do, I took these pictures years ago um, when Dave Dumas was on me um, about lights from Alpine, uh, from Sierra La Rana, because they were trying to promote it as an astronomical community, at least a portion of it. And Duncan Disposal, I paid them a visit and they had these metal halide floodlights all aimed up at very high angles. And I suggested that they aim them down and they told me, well, they came with shields. They're in the box. I'm like, put them on. <laughs> and they did, they put the shields on, uh, but they didn't aim the lights down. They just left them aimed at the angle they had originally been. But even then, with the shields attached from Sierra La Rana, here's before, here's after. And close up, before, and after. Just by putting shields on. Not aiming them down, just putting shields on. The Amtrak Depot, great lights. I'm glad they asked before they uh, installed them. There's a, a sag lens cover head right there um, that stands out in the photos, nighttime photos here. There's a couple of these down the, the rail. But here's a nighttime view. Here's the, those full cutoff lights that they installed along the platform that are really nice. There's one of the sag lens cover heads here and here where you can see the glare. They're not shielded, and then there are these two wall packs on the parking lot side, which are unshielded, metal halide that are lighting up across the street. And then this I got from a photo contest that somebody held here in Alpine, also taken from Hancock Hill, really neat image, shows the Milky Way kind of disappearing into the glow, uh, rising. This is Duncan disposal here. This is the tech, I think it's a textile facility, isn't it? Right there on the highway. Um, anyway, um, this is the main body of Alpine over here, uh, and you can see the, the glow coming up from the city washes out uh, the Milky Way. So uh, on that note, I'll say, um, Uncle, let's take a break, please. I've got a few demonstrations I want to set up and show you, and a few more slides, and we'll wrap it up. Is that all right? Short break. How are we doing time-wise? 3.15. Yeah, we're in good shape.
somebody, you know, reach out to
coming up at a high angle. I'm sorry to the, the players if you're getting clearance over there. Um, I'm going to put it up against the screen so you can see the footprint of the light distribution coming out of this picture. Now, the bowl was recessed way up in here, so this is kind of an exaggeration. Uh, a typical commercial flood for outdoor lighting would probably have the bowl much closer to the, the front of the picture. You have a wider cone coming out of there. But when you aim a floodlight sideways like this to throw the light as far down range as possible, half of the light is going up into the sky. Let's say, for argument's sake, that the end of the stage is our property line. So what we would say, well, first from a dark sky point of view, from an astronomer's point of view, you aim this light down until this upper distribution falls below the horizon, like this. And, I mean, now it's no longer really a threat to astronomy. No light shining directly into the sky. And you may have a neighbor blocks down the road whose uh, bedroom window is where the, the trash bins are, or the recycling bins are. And this is shining right in your bedroom window. We were talking about this today, but I hear about this a lot from people. Could you please talk to my neighbor? And it's kind of like, have you spoken to your neighbor? Um, so anyway, um, so what we want to do is continue to aim this light down until that distribution, that light falls in on our property line. Now all that light that was being wasted up into the sky is on your property. You don't have the dark spot underneath where you mounted it anymore. You're getting your nickels worth, basically. All your light is now on your property. Um, you know, one way to think of this is that if everyone would simply keep their own light on their own property, problem solved. Okay? Really, just that simple. I'm also going to demonstrate later. Sorry. I know that's not very kind. Um, but I want you to, to notice, though, that it doesn't hurt. It doesn't really become debilitating until you see the bare bowl, okay? It's that bare light source that you don't want to see for good visibility, for reduced glare, better visibility, okay? That's a real important thing to keep in mind. And there's something that's, I think, in the new language when it comes to light trespass, the new ordinance language. Now, um, I have a couple of other demos here. I'm gonna have to do this without hurting myself. I'm blind. There we go. This one is really a lot of fun. Um, school kids walk do this in classrooms any opportunity I get. And uh, I don't know, I, I, let me see. Eric, I think I can get away with doing this on across the table from you so everybody can see it well. Some of you may need to stand up. I've got a night light here. So this is all the way night light. But, uh, but in a piece of property, I'm going to light up. I'm going to make a lamp first. Oh, I've also got a thermal. Okay. Now I'm going to turn this into a lamp post. Kind of like the main street light, the globe light, the globe on top. I'm going to light up my property. <laughs> all right. Almost all the lights go in skyward. I've got a piece of PVC pipe here. All right. You can take this. All that light being wasted into the night sky. I can capture it with the shield and put it down on my property. Okay? And I'll call your, I can see the shadow line here. I'll call your attention to the fact 
that when you see the bare bulb, then your visibility is, is impeded. It's impaired. You don't want to see the bare bulb. Okay? Great group. Kids of all ages. Adults included. <laughs> I've got a few scale, uh, life size, not scale lamps, but a few lamps to show you here. Just their side by side comparisons, different color temperature. Probably the most common that people are familiar with are these jelly jar fixtures. And I, it's not, it, this is a compact fluorescent 2700 degrees Kelvin. Uh, this jelly jar, you'll recognize, you see these on, you know, outside of the front doors of a lot of trailer homes and what have you. And I know the bulb in here is very bright, so I don't want to hurt anybody, but... And that's, uh, that's 5,500 degrees, that's daylight light, okay? And there's a number of things you can do with this. Um, somebody got really clever and came up, I don't think you can find these on the shelves anymore, but I've got a box of them. This is a, a compact fluorescent bulb inside this machined aluminum cone that could very easily go into any such socket. Oops. Very easily. <laughs> I think it's probably two sockets, two, two forks, screw all the way in. So steps, the front porch, all that, but it's not lighting up the surrounding countryside like that. Um, other is a floodlight, which we've already played with a little bit, but again, once you see the bare bulb, then the glare is, uh, it hampers your visibility, it impairs your visibility when you see, see the glare. And then you can buy, this is, uh, this was $16 from Lowe's. And that's, again, daylight, light LED. Um, but it provides the light without the glare. It's lighting up, remember, four times the, the distance of the mountain height. So this being about six feet, 24 feet out, you've got use of illumination. So these are good, good little side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, okay, um, I think that's, let me get my slideshow working again. Don't worry about the light, I can see. I did just stare at that front wall. I do want to try and wrap it up here. reminiscent of the stripes situation, although I, don't, I haven't heard anybody complain about it. 
that y'all recognize Brother Caesars from in town. And uh, let me find the little thing you want in here. Floodlights aimed up, high angles. I stopped, took a picture here, walked over into the parking lot, and aimed my camera across Highway 90 to look at the neighborhood across the street. This uh, this tree back there, that's like a walk away easy, and that's coming from these flood, the, the lights that last time I, I saw are still aimed at this angle, uh, and there's just, there's no need for it. I mean, it, it's just lighting up the, the neighborhood across the street. There, with those lights aimed straight down, they would still have plenty of light in the parking lot without the glare that people would have as they drive in to buy a pizza, okay? Here's a Little Caesars in Flagstaff. This is the light fixture. A full cutoff wall back, okay? And I'll ask you, this, this is a pop quiz. <laughs> what, what's wrong with this picture? This is a full cutoff LED wall back. That is not full cutoff. It's cantilevered up like that. You can see those bare bulbs from, from eye level. Okay, so my point is that if you're online shopping for night sky, dark sky friendly light fixtures, there are a lot of people who would like to sell you dark sky friendly light fixtures. And a lot of times they will call something dark sky friendly when it's really not. That is not a full cutoff fixture. Okay? The light will, the light is free to shine up from this. Okay? It needs to be cut off right there at the level of the light source. So, um, and this was in, in the agenda, kind of a handout that, that bear outlined it that went out before. Um, it had three points about uh, directing light. Um, just basic guidelines. These are all incorporated in the proposed language. Some already in the existing language for the outdoor lighting ordinance. Um, in fact, there, there was some confusion, or there is some confusion. Um, the IDA, the International Dark Sky Association, took a look at uh, the proposed language um, that we've offered up to the city of Alpine, and <clears throat> the definition currently is full cutoff. Full, that you saw in the previous slide, full cutoff. This is the definition for full cutoff. I mean, the IESNA, the Illuminating, Illuminating Engineering Society, defines full cutoff, and I'm paraphrasing, but no light is to be emitted above the imaginary horizontal plane intersecting the lowest portion of the light, or the light emitting part of the thereabouts. Okay, so no light shining directly above the horizon. And, and the IEA sent the draft back and had scratched out full cutoff and written in fully shielded. And I don't know what that means because that has a different definition. Uh, fully shielded is a different thing altogether, but here, here's a diagram to illustrate full cutoff at least. Again, no light above the horizontal plane at the bottom of the fixture. The lowest light emitting portion of the fixture. Now fully shielded to me means this. Shield and aim the fixture as necessary to prevent the light source, the bulb, from being visible from off-site or off-body. Okay? Now that's, that's more stringent than full cutoff. You could have, you could have this fixture on the side of a, a, a roadway that's lighted up the house, you know, away from the road. Because uh, the light's going out every which way, right? Full cutoff, uh, fully shielded would, would mean the addition of more shielding. Now let me show you, this cracks me up, um, what people will do when left to their own devices. This is an old photo. I, I saw this meme ahead, this uh, barnyard mercury vapor light driving up the Pecos on Highway 17 one day. And I said, oh, that's weird. That's cool. I had to stop and take a picture. 
And then I, I went up the street a little further and looked back the other direction and saw what was going on. There's the opaque side facing away. Somebody had a bedroom window right here. They blacked out that side of the fixture. Here's one up in Midland. Bedroom window. Look at this at night. See the shadow line right there? They dramatically reduced the amount of light shining in the bedroom window. That's what people do. I don't know what they did, shimmy up a pole with spray paint or duct tape or what, I don't know, but it's pretty hilarious. Um, and, and lighting manufacturers recognize this. This was in Phoenix. I was driving a rental car back to the airport and came across this, a backlight shield. This is kind of the scenario I was describing before. This is a roadway light, but away from the road, homes that don't want to be lit up by a street light, okay? Third point, maximum color temperature of 2,700 degrees Kelvin. Actually, there are no degrees Kelvin. They call, they call a degree Kelvin, but Kelvin is 2,700 Kelvins, I think is the proper way to say it. The physicist in the crowd may be able to correct me on that. Um, and no more than 100,000 lumens per acre for non-residential development. Now, this is intended to prevent the kind of over-lighting that we talked about, you know, the ratcheting and uh, the service station. And, you're, and, and you know, my goal here in this language was to try and keep things as non-technical as possible, to keep it simple, commonsensical, but, you know, okay, you've got 2,700 Kelvins here, You've got 100,000 lumens per acre. What are these technical terms doing in here? Well, next time you buy a light bulb, look at the box. 3,000 degrees Kelvin, 2,900 degrees Kelvin, 800 lumen output, 565. This is an LED and this is a compact fluorescent, by the way. Uh, this is 12 watts, this is 43 watts, okay? The, the 12 watt bulb is putting out more light than the 43 watt bulb. But again, LEDs are just marvelous if they're used properly. But a, a, another point to, to make here is that if you are shopping for lighting, whether it be for indoors at your, your house or outside at your home or your business or your city, and you can't find this information, if, they, if the manufacturer or the retailer your, your lighting source does not make that information readily available, I wouldn't buy it. I'd keep shopping, okay? This is the information you need to make an informed decision, all right? Remember the, the Marble Falls um, stripe station and how brightly lit it is there at the gas pumps. That turns out to be daylight white. It's 50, 5,500 Kelvins. And we talked about 100,000 lumens per acre just for that gas pump canopy, 760,000 lumens. Okay, so it's way, way overly lit. Now, I'm not sure where I was going to go with all this. Oh, I, I did want to refer to some things that were on that were on the uh, the agenda that. Uh, that uh, I, I talked about the paths of least re resistance, I think. Um, going into, the, 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 we went into the ordinance guidelines, I already just, just went over that, but I, I always like to think of uh, an ordinance not as, I mean, sure, somebody's got to enforce it, but for me, it's a vehicle for education. It's a way to start the conversation and then talk about good lighting extol the virtues of good lighting as opposed to threatening people with a citation or you know beating them over the head with an ordinance but in terms of you know the things that are really really important to make sure that it gets done right and eric referred to this uh, earlier in conversation was that you know new builds new stuff going in as long as people are aware that there is a lighting ordinance uh, and they have a copy of it and can look at it they're going to put 
they're going to vote yes, but lightly. I mean, they're aware of what is required of them. They will do it. I'm confident of that. Um, in terms of getting other older lights changed out, um, you need to talk to whoever the owner of that light is, A or B, whoever's paying the utility bill. I mean, the, the light may be owned by ADP, but you know, th whoever's paying the, the bill for the electricity is the customer. And if, if the customer asks the utility to please shield this light or replace it with a uh, full cut off, um, then the utility should uh, honor their customer's request. Uh, the path of least resistance, the, the, the strongest arguments, you remember there was dark skies, cost efficiency, safety and, and security, uh, health, and then aesthetics. Which one of those do you think is going to be the most persuasive argument? Cost. Anybody? Cost. Cost. Cost efficiency. I mean, you know, get them where they live. Uh, again, cities around the world jumped on the LED bandwagon. Um, and many to their regret. And then <laughs> number four, point number four here, I, I put down is chocolate cake. Um, again, people will call me up and say, my neighbor, will you please talk to my neighbor? And I'm like, well, have you spoken to your neighbor? And, oh, no, no, I can't, no, no. You know, we'll get into a fight or, or whatever. And, and my advice is, look, buy a replacement fixture. Okay, go to the store, go, go online, Get a replacement fixture, walk up to their front door with the, the replacement fixture in one hand and the chocolate cake in the other hand, and be nice. Um, and that is really the simplest way I have found to get it done. So, in other words, helping, offering to offset the cost to somebody is a really big deal. Let, let me show you one very pleasing example. Um, this is up in Balmeray. This is the Balmeray community. Center. Not nearly as nice as what you guys have got here. But uh, this, this, by the way, is not in city limits of Balmeray. It's in Reeves County. So actually, if that problem in Reeves County is good, which is fine. But uh, they had um, they had two on here and then four. So there was uh, six. There were 12 lights around this building. And they were actually some different color textures. And we didn't have a lot of money in our budget, and we, we don't really like to say, uh, look, we'll pay for it all anyway. We think of it as seed money. If, if we buy uh, these four fixtures, um, then good enough, okay? We, we actually didn't expect these to get changed. They're under the ease. We thought, well, let's target these. And lo and behold, we provided the four replacement fixtures for either side, and the county sprung for the cost for the other eight front and back. So it's just a gesture of goodwill. We understand that this is, you know, asking you to incur expense. We will help if, if we can. Uh, we're very fortunate at McDonald Observatory to have a, a group of donors, um, some of whom will earmark money for night sky preservation. And so we have a little pot of money that we can use to purchase replacement fixtures and offer to help offset the cost um, for some of this stuff. So that, that's not out of the question. Uh, certainly grant money and stuff for bigger projects would be required, but uh, um, it, it just goes to show the goodwill that can be engendered by offering to help, okay? They went ahead and replaced all the fixtures, not just the ones we offered them. This is in the, the existing ordinance of uh, Acceptable, not so acceptable fixtures. I've got a key that's stuck on me from my computer. I'm going to have to take it back. Um, the, the last thing, really, it is pretty much the last thing I wanted to mention. One of the reasons why we have asked the city of Alpine to revisit this ordinance language is because, and I think it was James Walker back in 2010 or so that introduced this. Why, I don't know. But there is a provision for pole mounted floodlights to be aimed 20 degrees off of the vertical axis, okay? Um, that is in direct contradiction to the full cutoff requirement, okay? It's not full cutoff if it's tilted up 20 degrees. 
uh, unless the light source is recessed way up in the fixture like that plug light I was showing you before. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why you know we need to uh, address this. And um, well, uh, just uh, what next? Compare the current language with the proposed language. I think you all have that. I did find one formatting error in there. The, the, the fully shielded definition is is in the wrong paragraph. It's up in the floodlight definition. F full cut floodlight full cut on the fully shielded. Um, for, and so this is workshop number two, basically, which will be after the election. I understand. And then probably the new year workshop number three will formulate a final draft to go to the full city council. And for homework, folks, um, identify examples of full lighting. Just look at them. I mean, go out and look and see if you can find them. <laughs> I had a couple come up to me years ago, and the gentleman called me a, a rather unkind name, and I said, I beg your pardon. And he said, well, we came to one of your talks years ago. Now, everywhere we go, we're looking at light fixtures. And imagine this city, we're driving out of the airport, my wife's going, oh, look, there's a good one. Oh, that's horrible of it, and she's driving. You know, it's like, so once you see it, you really can't unsee it. Once it clicks, it's like you're going to see good lighting, bad lighting everywhere you go. Sorry. I mean, but it, it, it happens that way. And you just see for yourself. Just to see. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. And, and again, lastly, I'll, I'll, I'll throw in that um, we're trying to protect the whole region here. And um, so Alpine is really where we wanted to start. It's the biggest municipality uh, in the area. There, there are only four in the Tri-County area, Alpine, Marfa, Valentine, and Presidio. Valentine, by the way, has already adopted language very similar to what we proposed uh, for the city of uh, Alpine. Um, so next stop will be Marfa and then Presidio, or maybe we can, once we get Alpine um, uh, happy, then we can uh, just uh, go on. I, I've actually been in contact with Brad Newton down at Presidio. TechStock's putting up some lights he's not happy with, so there may be an opportunity to, to get things moving there sooner rather than later. And we also need to visit the commissioner's courts uh, in the three counties to uh, revise their language as well, because that, that 20 degree floodlight thing found its way into a number of different ordinances uh, without my knowledge. So anyway, so it goes. Uh, but um, this would be really cool. I mean, if we can get the largest dark sky reserve on the planet right here in West Texas, I mean, if you think it's a dark sky destination now, um, I think it would really, really take off. So uh, on that note, heck, it's almost four o'clock. So I'm going to be quiet and thank you all very much for your time and attention. Um, hope you enjoyed it, learned something. Any questions? Anybody?